Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you covered by Social Security? Then please listen carefully. Public opinion polls by the Equitable Life Assurance Society show that millions of Americans know little or nothing about their Social Security. Yes, according to these Equitable Society surveys, you may be failing to safeguard rights worth thousands of dollars to you and your family. Therefore, as a public service, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will devote this program's entire middle commercial, due in just 14 minutes, to information on Social Security. Information that may mean money in your pocket. Tonight's FBI file, The Jewel-Laden Jockey. There are those among us who see stories in their daily newspapers about new crimes which have just been committed and who conveniently skip over those items because crime is unpleasant and affords them no escape from reality. It is not important that you read every article about every criminal, but it is important that you, as a citizen, be cognizant of the current situation, that you be acquainted with some of the shocking facts about the crime wave. Those facts, like the one which tells you that there are 36 murders committed every day in this country, are vital to you because if enough of your fellow citizens learn them, they will act. They will see to it that your local police force is given the weapons it needs to fight the crime wave and to fight it to a successful and speedy conclusion. Tonight's file opens at a small half-mile racetrack in a Midwestern state. Pop Campbell, one of the trainers, is standing at the rail with his daughter Betty. It is 6.30 in the morning, just getting light, but already there are horses on the track getting their morning workout. That's Jupiter's boy, isn't it, Pop? Yeah. I caught him in 52 flat. Ah, uh, he's the one to beat this afternoon. Nah, we can beat him if Scotty gets here to ride. Wonder what happened to Scotty. He's never done this before. He knew Black World was going today. Hmm, Pop. Hmm? Whitey's waiting for you. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay, Whitey! Let him run! He's letting him out. Yeah, honey, I, I, I told him to. Doesn't look like that ankle's bothering him at all. No. No, I think it's going to be okay. I hope so. Excuse me. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah? You, Pop Campbell? Uh-huh. I'm a friend of Scotty's. Well, uh... He ain't around. Yeah, yeah, I know. You brought his tack bag here, didn't you? Well, yeah, that's right. He wants me to pick it up. What for? I don't know what for. He just said he wanted me to pick up his tack bag from Pop Campbell. Where is Scotty? In town. 
Did he give you a note? He said I wouldn't need a note. You do before you get the bag from me. Now, look, Pop. Go away, mister. Go away. I'm busy. I'm busy. Okay. I'll go. But I'll be back. Pop! Pop! He did it in 51 4. Pop, did you hear me? Hmm? He just worked in 51 4 breathing. Yeah. Well, aren't you pleased? Oh, yes, yeah, sure, honey. I've just been thinking about something else. That man who wanted Scotty's bag? Yeah. I was just wondering what could be in that bag that made him want it so much. Later that morning in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Bruce Bedford. Hi, Bruce. Oh, hello, Jim. Boss just called, said I should check with you. Yeah, he wants us to work together on this case that just came in. Hmm? What is it? Well, so far as we know, it's murder. Where did it happen? On the train from Chicago sometime last night. Hmm. How much do we know? Oh, enough to start on, but not enough to get very far with. <laughs> that sounds familiar. Yeah. Who was killed? A man named Richard Scott. He was a jockey. At one time, he rode at some of the big tracks, but he's ridden mostly at county fairs and half-mile tracks around this part of the country. I see. Whoever killed him probably used a silencer on his gun because the porter claims he never heard any shot fired. Mm -hmm. When was the body discovered? This morning in his compartment. It's a little odd for a small-time jockey like that to travel in a compartment. Scott liked to live as well as he could, according to what I found out so far. Well, why was this office given the case? Because Scott was en route to the city. Mm. Probably to ride out of Whitman Park. Racing starts out there today. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, that's probably where he was headed. Anything else in the report on Scott? Yes, his bag was rifled and his clothes were scattered all over the compartment. There was an address book found in Scott's clothes that may prove to be an interesting collection of names. Why? Well, two of the names were people here in town, and both of them are suspected by the police of being fences with stolen jewelry. Oh, well, how about the other names from out of town? They're being checked now. Mm-hmm. How about the bullet that killed Scott? It was shot from a thirty-eight. It's being checked at the unidentified ammunition file right now. Bruce, as soon as we get a report from either source, we'll go to work. Whoa, whoa, quiet, boy, quiet now. Come on, come on, stand still. <laughs> he hates to be combed. If he only knew how pretty it made him. Well, I hope he looks this pretty this afternoon. Ah, he will, Pop. He's going to win us a nice purse. Aren't you, boy? <laughs> Golden image goes tomorrow. How far? Six. You don't seem to like to win at six. Oh, I think maybe against these horses down here. She'll she'll do better. If we win a purse, maybe we can claim another horse, huh? Well, honey, we can't carry more than two in the van unless we move our stuff out. I'd like to claim Jupiter's boy. I think we could do something with that horse. Well, Radford knows his business, honey. If he's dropping his horse in that kind of a race, he... Say, that's Golden Image. What's the matter with her? Well, it sounds like there's somebody in her stall. Somebody she don't know. I'll go see. Well, wait, I'll come with you. Pop, did you see a man run out the back way? Yeah. I'm going after him. No, 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 Betty, come back here. But, Pop, maybe he stole something. I don't care if he did. I don't want you getting hurt. Now, come on back here. Okay. Oh, I steady. Come on. Steady now, steady. Come on. Steady, boy. Ah. Well, don't look like he harmed golden image. None anyway. Oh, take it easy. Pop, look. Huh? In the corner. Scotty's tax bag. Yeah. Stuff spread all over the floor. Pop. Let's tell the police about this. Yeah. yeah I think I will. Jim, uh, did you get anything back yet on your queries? Yes, I just got the report back on Scott's address book. Oh, uh, what about those names from out of town? Almost every one of them is a suspected fence. Mm. Sounds like Scott was mixed up in something more than horse racing. Mm. In fact, we know he was. One of the suspected fences admitted that Scott worked with him. And what was his job? Well, Scott used to be the messenger for a whole flock of dealers in stolen jewelry. 
It was easy for him to carry it without suspicion. Well, that establishes the motive for the murder, then. Yeah, the killer undoubtedly knew that Scott was carrying some jewelry to deliver to someone here in the city. Uh, how about checking those two names that were in the book from here in town? Oh, I just finished talking to them. Huh? They both admitted knowing Scott, but denied that they were expecting him to bring anything to them. Mm -hmm. Scott was traveling with only one bag. I, I wonder where the rest of his stuff is. Oh, I called the Ritchie State Fairgrounds where Scott rode last week. They checked on that for me. Uh, what'd they find? Well, Scott ordinarily traveled with a man named Pop Campbell and his daughter Betty. Yeah, who are they? Campbell's what they call a gypsy around the racetracks. He owns two horses, trains them himself, hmm. and lives on whatever the horses win. I see. Now, Scott was his jockey. Ordinarily, the three of them travel together right with the horses. Well, this time, Scott came by train. I wonder why. I don't know, Bruce. But we can find that out easily enough. Let's go out to Whitman Park and talk to Pop Campbell. <laughs> Pretty interesting back here. I've never been behind the scenes at a racetrack. Yeah. See those horses? They're walking around. They? Yeah, they're cooling them off. They've already raced this afternoon. <laughs> kind of like unwinding them. Yeah, that's about it. Oh, well, that's stable four twenty three over there, Jim, where yeah. that girl is standing. Oh yeah. Hello there. Hello. My name is Taylor. We're special agents of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Okay. This is Special Agent Bedford. I'm Betty Campbell. How do you do? You're Pop Campbell's daughter? That's right. Is your father here? No, he's not. Uh, do you know where we might reach him? No. He went into town. I expect him back soon, though, if you want to stick around. Well? Is it about that man this morning? Well, what man, Miss Campbell? The man who tried to steal something from the stable. No, no. As a matter of fact, we didn't know anything about that. We wanted to ask him a few questions about a jockey named Richard Scott. Uh, maybe you can help us, Miss Campbell. Sure, I'll try. I know Scotty pretty well. Is he in trouble? He was killed last night. What? I'm... I'm sorry to have to break the news to you this way. How did it happen? We don't know all the details yet ourselves, Miss Campbell. How can we help you, Mr. Taylor? Well, the first thing Mr. Bedford and I would like to do is take a look at that tack bag that Scotty shipped down here in your van. Sure. It's right inside that door. That's what the man who broke in was looking through, and we scared him away. Oh? Here you are, Mr. Taylor. The bag is... Well, what's the matter, Miss Campbell? The bag. Yes? It's gone. Is Scotty here? You, Pop Campbell? Yeah, that's right. I got his message asking me to come by here. Come on in. Thank you. He'll be with you in a minute. Tell him I'm in a hurry. I got to get back to the track. Hello, Pop. Hmm? I said hello. Hey, you're the man who was at the track this morning. Yeah, that's right. What are you doing here? I live here. But I got a message from Scotty to bring his tack bag here. Me and my partner here left that message for you. Oh, I get it. Well, I still ain't giving you this bag. We don't want it anymore. We've already gone through the bag, Pop. So you're the one who was at the stable this morning? Yeah. We didn't find what we wanted. That's why we had you come here. What were you looking for? Scotty had a package in that bag, and we think you know where it is. I never looked in Scotty's tack bag in my life. How would I know? Look, Pop, uh, take my advice, huh? You better tell us what we want to know. It'll work out nicer for you. How can I tell you what I don't know myself? Now, look, Pop. Johnny, let me handle this. Where's the package, Pop? I told you, I don't know. You're a liar. No. Uh. Let him get up by himself, Johnny. Maybe now he'll remember. return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI provides national security. Now an important message about social security, your social security. Do you know how to get the most out of it? Do you know what steps you should take to safeguard your rights? A great many people don't. That's why the Equitable Society offers all listeners to this program without charge 
a special service on Social Security consisting of three steps. First step, full information. When you have a question about Social Security, put it up to your Equitable Society representative. He knows the answer. For instance, you may be surprised to learn that a person doesn't have to be 65 to be eligible for benefits, or that your rights under Social Security may be worth from twelve dollars to $18,000, depending on your age, salary, and other factors. Why be ill-informed or misinformed about such a valuable asset? Get all the facts. See your Equitable representative. Second step... An immediate checkup on your position under Social Security. In any account, there's always danger of mistakes being made, and some of them cannot be corrected after four years. To protect your rights, the Social Security Administration advises you to make regular checkups on your account. The simple way to do this is to get a special form from your equitable representative, a form approved by the Social Security Administration. This checkup is doubly important because after you've made it, You're ready to profit from the final step of this service offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That step is to help you build Social Security into full security. After you've found out where you stand in Social Security, your Equitable Society representative will show you how a comparatively modest investment in life insurance will build Social Security into full security. He'll show you how life insurance and Social Security, working as a team, can give you and your family a future free from money worries. There's no charge for this service, so see your Equitable Society representative. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Jewel-Laden Jockey. With a murder taking place every half hour, day and night, throughout the year, there are of necessity a variety of motives which lead to the crime. Some murders are committed because of an overwhelming desire for revenge, or a temporary emotional instability, or sheer unadulterated hatred of people. None of those murders can be condoned. But of the different classifications, the most socially reprehensible is the venal murder, the killing of a fellow man for profit, such as the murder in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Those murders are the most difficult to solve because they are usually committed by professional criminals who take pains to cover up their tracks. Sometimes they cover up so well that it seems for a while that they will be successful, as if they will escape without paying their just debt to society. Tonight's file continues in the local FBI field office. Bruce, we got a break on that Scott murder while you were out. Oh, good. What happened? The Chicago police picked up a jewel thief named Paul Harrison. Harris, how does he fit into this picture, Jim? Well, he was supposed to meet Scott yesterday at the railroad station in Chicago and give him some jewelry to bring here. Oh. But Harrison missed the train. And the Chicago police picked him up. Yeah, that's right. Now, Scott stayed on the train when it left the station, undoubtedly thinking that Harrison was aboard. Mm Mm-hmm. Then, when he heard a knock on his compartment door, he probably opened it, thinking that it was Harrison. Yes, that sounds like what happened, Jim. Whoever it was who killed Scott certainly knew in advance that he was supposed to be carrying those jewels. Yeah. Yeah, this was a double cross of some kind, I think. That was all the jewelry recovered with Harrison's arrest. Yes, every bit of it. But that doesn't end our job in this case, Bruce. Even though Scott was mixed up in crime, we've still got to find his killer. <laughs> Pop, he's out, Al. He ain't gonna stay out. Give me that glass of water on the table. Here. Come on, Pop, come around. Uh, Get with it, will you? Now, let me take over for a while, huh? Uh, Okay. Pop, Pop, are you waking up now to hear me? Uh, Yeah. Then listen to me, huh? I don't like to see Al keep hitting you. But we got to find out where that package is. I told you, ask Scotty. He'll tell you he never gave me any package. We can't ask Scotty, Pop. He's dead. What? He had an accident on the train. 
What happened to him? Take one guess. Oh. Now, you wouldn't want the same thing to happen to you, would you? No, no. Now, look, Pop. You train horses for a living, right? Yeah. Okay, we do this for a living. You don't like your job to be any tougher than it has to be, so neither do we. Now, why don't you stop all this and tell us where the package is? I don't know. Why do you keep saying I don't know? Because cause it's true. Look, Johnny, let me start again. It's up to you, Pop. Do you want him to? How can I tell you what I don't know? Okay, I'll go to work again. <laughs> Jim, I just finished making a half a dozen phone calls trying to find some of Scott's close friends. Good. Maybe we can get a lead from one of them. Oh, Miss Campbell's on her way in here. Maybe she's got some news. What's she doing here? I don't know, Bruce. The receptionist just called in, asked if it was all right to send her in. I think we ought to go back to the track, Jim. Why? You got some kind of a lead out there? No, but maybe some of those jockeys can give us some dope on Scott, huh? Yeah. I don't seem to be able to locate anybody who knows much about him. May I well, come in, we... Mr. Taylor? Oh, yes, Miss Campbell, please well, do. Hello there. Hi. Mr. Taylor, I think Pop's in trouble. Why? What's happened? Black World, one of our horses, was in the fourth race, and Pop didn't show up. Oh? After the race, I went looking for him. Does he always stay at the track during the races? Well, sure, when we have a horse running, he does. I looked all over for him, and finally in the kitchen where all the horse people eat, I got Pop's message. What message was that? He told the man behind the counter to tell me that he'd be back in time for the race. That was after we spoke to you, wasn't it? That's right. He might have just been delayed someplace. I wouldn't be too concerned. But the counter man told me that Pop said he was going to meet Scotty. He what? You see? He didn't know that Scotty had been killed. Bruce, it sounds like a trap to get him into town. Yeah. Miss Campbell, do you have any idea where he might have gone when he left the trap? Yes, he got a lift with George Barrow. Who? He's a trainer. He's got a public stable. Oh, I see. And did uh, Barrow return to the track? Yes. I asked him where Pop was, and he said that he let him out at Main and 7th, and that Pop said he was going to catch a streetcar from there. Main and 7th. But Barrow didn't see what streetcar your father took, did he? No. Seems to me the first thing we've got to do is find out who we're looking for. Bruce, yeah. suppose you take Miss Campbell with you and go on down to police headquarters. Right. What for, Mr. Taylor? Oh, uh, Mr. Bedford will help you look through their file of pictures and see if you can pick out the man who came to see you. Uh, I'm going out to the track, Bruce. I'll meet the two of you out there. Oh, Jim. Oh, hello, Bruce. Where's Miss Campbell? She's pretty shaken, Jim, so I took her over to their van. She promised she'd try to get a little rest. No, I swear. She identified the man who came out here this morning. Oh, who is it? Al Edwards. Edwards, Edwards. I remember him, but I thought he was doing time. So did the police, but we checked, and he's out on parole. Another one of those, huh? Yeah. How did you make out? I'm waiting now to talk to that counter man that Miss Campbell told us about. The one who knew Pop was going to meet Scotty. Yeah, that's him. He's coming down to see me as soon as they can locate him. Bruce. Hmm? Miss Campbell made a positive identification on Edwards, didn't she? I mean, there's no chance of her being wrong. None at all, Jim. Mr. Taylor? Yes, that's right. I'm the counterman that Pop Campbell talked to. Oh, good. Uh, Did you hear him say where he was going by any chance? He said he was going to meet Scotty. Hmm? Where? Well, I think I heard him say uh, 7-Eleven, Wyoming. 7-Eleven, Wyoming. I remember the number because it's so easy. Yeah, well, you wouldn't remember whether that was Wyoming Avenue or Wyoming Street, would you? No, sir, that's that's all I remember. There's also a Wyoming place up on the north side, Jim. Well, that's right, there is. Well, the only thing we can do is check all three. Oh, thanks very much, sir. You're welcome. Come on, Bruce, let's go. Well, check this one off, Bruce. No luck, huh? No, Dr. Logan lives in this house. Suppose we try 7-Eleven Wyoming Street now. That's right in the neighborhood, isn't it? That's right. Okay, let's go. Wyoming Street isn't the answer either, Bruce. Who lives in this house? 20 women. It's a girls' boarding house. Well, that doesn't leave us much choice. That's right. Wyoming Place is the only other possibility. Come on. Bruce, this can't be the right place either. It's a minister's home. Well, it's not Wyoming Avenue, Wyoming Street, or Wyoming Place. But it has to be an address, doesn't it, Jim? Yes, I should think so. Hey, wait a minute, Bruce. Why didn't we think of this before? Head back into town. Suppose 
suppose I should bring the old guy around again, Johnny? Oh, just let him stay where he is. But he can't tell us nothing while he's out. I don't think he knows, Zal. I think he's leveling with us. If he knew, he'd have talked by now. You mean we did all this for nothing? Well, well, that's the way it goes. You win one, you lose one. I ain't win one in six months now. Don't let it get you done. We'll get lucky with something else. What do we do now? Blow? Not yet. Why not? We can't just walk out and leave the old guy the way he is. He won't come to for a couple of hours yet. But when he does, he goes right to the cops. So what? We'll be gone by then. I, uh, just as soon we had more start than that. Oh. I took the silencer off my gun. Put it back on. It's Jan. And forget the silencer. They'll hear it all over the hotel. In this trap, Al, it'll sound like sweet music. Yeah. Uh, just look out in the hall. See if it's empty. Okay. What's the right where you are? Uh, Drop that gun, Edwards. Who are you? Special agents of the FBI. We have a warrant here. You better call the doctor, Bruce. Campbell looks like he's taking a bad beating. Okay, Jim. We'll take these two downtown and book them. You got nothing on us? Nothing but the murder of Richard Scott. I'm just guessing, Al. The porter on the train that Scott was killed on can identify both of you. When he does, you take another train ride. This time, the government will buy your tickets. Al Edwards and his companion, Johnny Russell, were convicted in federal court for theft from interstate shipment. They were given long prison sentences, then turned over to a local court for prosecution for the murder of Richard Scott. The idea which came to Special Agent Taylor after he and Agent Bedford had failed to locate the wanted criminals at Wyoming Avenue, Wyoming Street, and Wyoming Place was that there was a Wyoming hotel and that 7-Eleven Wyoming could mean room 7-Eleven. When that proved to be correct, the case was closed, and thus another murder was prevented by the quick, thorough work of your FBI. This case was opened and closed within a period of 15 hours from 9 o'clock one morning to midnight that evening. Some cases work out that way. Others drag on, and the development of clues sometimes takes months and even years. But no matter how long a period elapses, your FBI stays on the job until a clerk in the records section takes a rubber stamp and marks the file. Marks it convicted. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now a quick review of the special three-point service offered by your Equitable Society representative to help you get the most out of Social Security. First, he gives you a clear picture of what Social Security can accomplish for you. Second, your Equitable Society representative supplies you with the special form approved by the Social Security Administration for checking up on your position under Social Security. Third, he shows you how easy and inexpensive it is to build Social Security into full security. Don't fail to take advantage of this special service offered without charge by your Equitable Representative and the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A behind-the-scenes glimpse into the home life of a hold-up man. Its subject, impersonation. Its title, The Henpecked Hijacker. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States 
and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Henpecked Hijacker on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you covered by Social Security? Then please listen carefully. Public opinion polls by the Equitable Life Assurance Society show that millions of Americans know little or nothing about their Social Security. Yes, according to these Equitable Society surveys, you may be failing to safeguard rights worth thousands of dollars to you and your family. Therefore, as a public service, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will devote this program's entire middle commercial, due in just 14 minutes, to information on Social Security. Information that may mean money in your pocket. Tonight's FBI file, The Henpecked Hijacker. There are many people throughout the nation who hear the statistics of the current crime wave, statistics like the one which tells that there is a major crime committed in this country every 20 seconds who shake their heads and give us their opinion the theory that nothing is being done to stop the criminal. Nothing could be further from the truth. What those people must realize is that the number of law enforcement officers is limited. And in that limitation, the criminal enjoys an initial advantage. There is, according to the latest survey made by your FBI, approximately 130,000 police officers in the country, or one to every thousand people. Obviously, it is impossible for that one law enforcement officer to keep a watch on a thousand people. For that reason, the wonder is not that there are as many crimes as there are. The wonder is that there aren't more. Tonight's file opens in a small furnished apartment in the midtown section of an eastern city. It is early evening, and Marge and Jean Wheeler have just finished dinner. Where are you going? Get my cigarettes. You might help me with the dishes, you know. Leave them till later. Then you'll be too tired to help me. Want a cigarette? No, thanks. What's the matter with you tonight? Every time I've said anything, you've yapped at me. I had lunch with Ann and Ruthie today. Oh, you got loaded. I only huh? had two drinks. I'll get with it. What's eating you? Ruthie was wearing a new mink coat today. Uh-huh. Anne had a diamond bracelet that must have cost Harry 5000 Well, so what? Why should that make you sore? Because I felt like a poor relation. I don't get it. They sat there, and they boasted about how great their husbands are doing. How do you think I felt? Well, I don't think I'm doing so bad. I'm making close to 10000 a year now, and it's steady. 10000 a year. Harry makes that in one night. Well, let him make it his way. I'll make it in mine. Haven't you got any ambition? Well, sure. You and Harry and George all started out together. You're as good as they are. I want to see you do as good as them. Honey, Harry sticks up a bank maybe twice a year, and he lives on that the rest of the time. I couldn't do that. Why not? Because I don't like guns. If I walked into a bank with a gun and stood in front of all those people, I'd, I'd feel foolish. All right. Do what George does. George is a hijacker. You need a gun for that, too. I just want to go along my own easy way with little stock market swindles and let everybody else live their own lives. Sure. Sure, let everybody live their own lives. What about mine? Doing my own cleaning, my own cooking, making my own clothes, I'm sick of it. You better make dough, big dough, and make it fast. But I No can't... buts about it. 
There's only one way to do it, and that's with a gun. You got one. Use it. Marge, I love you, and I'd do anything to make you happy, but I can't use that gun on a job. That's final. Look, if you don't go out and steal something big inside of the next month, I'm leaving you. And that's final, too. Hey, Gene. Gene. Oh, hello, Eddie. And since when have you been a nature lover? I could ask you the same question. Oh, I come out to the park every day. They come to pee- feed the pigeons. You ever do it? No. <laughs> They're just like people. Some of them are stupid and some of them are smart. You see that black one down there? Uh-huh. He's a real larceny bum. Watch what happens when I throw this handful of peanuts. He wind up with the biggest ones. <laughs> you see that, Gene? What a beautiful thief. Yeah. Well, what's the matter with you, kid? Yeah, kind of down. I am. Well, what's wrong? It's Marge. Your wife? Yeah, she's beefing. Says I gotta hit a jackpot. Well, what's wrong with the touch you got? It's not big enough for her. She wants me to use a gun. Well, why don't you? Oh, I can't, Eddie. I I just can't, that's all. <laughs> Stop worrying. She'll forget it by tomorrow. No, no, she's serious. She's gonna leave me if I don't do something. Well, if she wants to go that bad, let her go. I don't want her to go. Well, then... Maybe there's a way out. That's what I've been trying to think of. I've been digging over every dodge I ever heard about. Gene, I got it. What? Listen, you got any money stashed away? Yeah. I, I mean that Marge don't know about Oh, yeah, yeah, about, uh, about 1500 Well, that's perfect. Why? You know the Dawson Finance Company? You mean the place at Broadway and 38th? Yeah, that's it. I'm gonna stick it up tonight. What's that got to do with me? Well, I've worked joints like this before. I usually score for about a G, 1500 So what? So you go home tonight after midnight with 1500 Give it to Marge and tell her you've done the job. Oh, she won't believe me. Well, tell her to look in the papers tomorrow morning. The story will be there. She's got to go for it. Well, she might. I believe me, it's a cinch. I hate to go for the 1500 It'll be worth it. Yeah, yeah, if it works. It'll work. Hey, look, hand me those peanuts, will you? Pigeons are getting hungry. Is that you, Jean? Yeah, Marge. Well, where have you been? It's after one o'clock. You said you... Oh, now, now, take it easy, honey. I got a surprise for you. What? What does that look like? A gun. What does this look like? Gene, where did you get all that dough? I pulled the stick up. What? Now you asked me to use a gun, so I did. I can't believe it. How much did you get? A little over 1500 Where'd you do the job? Dawson Finance Company, Broadway and 38th. You did it all by yourself? Of course. Well, I must say, this is a surprise. I didn't think you'd ever do it, Gene. I'm proud of you, honey. Well, show it, will you? What do you mean? I'm tired. I had a tough night. Yeah, yeah, I know. Now, uh, where are the evening papers? Right here, honey. Now, let's have them, will you? Sure. And I'm hungry, Marge. I'd like a sandwich and a bottle of beer. Sure, sure. I'll fix something right away. Uh, anything else, dear? A little quiet. I want to read my papers. <laughs> At 2.30 that morning, Special Agent Jim Taylor returned to the local FBI field office to meet Agent Ben Adams. Hi, Ben. Oh, hi, Jim. Sorry I had to wake you. No, it's all right. Boss wanted to get started on this case right away before it got cold. Yeah, what's it about, Jim? Hold up. The Dawson Finance Company. It's a loan outfit up on Broadway and 38th Street. Mm-hmm. It was held up about 11.30 tonight. How'd we get in on a holdup? Well, the bandit entered the building by telling the elevator operator he was an FBI man. I see. He then went up to the finance company office on the 11th floor... Entered with a passkey and slugged Mr. Dawson. Well, sounds like it might have been an inside job. Well, I thought of that, Ben, but Dawson wasn't killed. He was only slugged. Now, if the bandit had been someone Dawson knew, I don't think he'd left him alive to give us an identification when he comes to. Well, that's true. Where's Dawson now? He's at emergency hospital. Did you get anything down at his office? No, not very much. Oh, I did pick up this page from the building register. Mm-hmm. This is the one the bandit signed. Mm-hmm. It's lucky it's the only signature on the page. Yeah, I thought we might get some prints off it. I'm going to send it over to the lab. I'll ask them to call you as soon as they've gotten anything. Where are you headed for? 
I'm going over to the hospital. I want to be around whenever Dawson comes to. Jane. Jane, wake up. Oh. Come on, get up. Oh, go away. Let me sleep. I'm tired. Get up. What do you want? Look at this. What? The morning paper. There's a big story about the stick-up on the front page. There is? What do they say? Where's the rest of it? The rest of what? The rest of the money from the stick-up. What are you talking about? The paper says the job was good for 22000 Why? You heard me. They had the same story on the radio this morning. Oh. Where's the rest of the dough? I haven't got it. Quit stalling. I'm not stalling, You got 22000 on the job. You gave me 1500 That makes you 20500 shy. Now, where is it? Marge, I got a confession to make. Well? I didn't do the job. What? Eddie Perkins did it. Wait a minute. What do you take me no, for? I swear to you, Eddie did the job. He told me about it in advance so I could make you think I did it. You're lying. Marge, I just did it to make you happy. There's only one way you can make me happy. Get me the rest of that 22000 yeah, but if you I don't, didn't. I'm walking out of here, and I'm not coming back. Anything come back from the lab, Ben? Yeah, they tried to smoke up some prints off that building register, oh. but none of them came up good enough to work on. Uh, that's too bad. I hope you had better luck at the hospital. Oh, little. I finally got in to see Dawson. How is he? He'll recover. He's got a nasty scalp wound, but it's not too serious. Could he give you anything? No, not much. When the bandit entered the office, he was wearing a brown handkerchief over his face as a mask. Uh -huh. Did he recognize the bandit's general physical setup as anyone who worked for him? Oh, he's only got women working in the office. Oh. So I went back down to his office after I spoke to him. He thought there might be some prints of the bandit on the cash box. The mm -hmm. bandit was the last one to handle it. Were there any? Well, the box was covered with prints, but it was impossible to pick out any distinct ones. We did get one break, though. Yeah. Got this handkerchief here. Oh, is that the one the bandit wore? Yeah, that's it. Where'd you find it? Oh, one of the cleaning women on the 11th floor found it in a closet about an hour ago. Mm. I took it back up to the hospital, and Dawson identified it. Yeah, I see, Jim. Well, there's a laundry mark on this handkerchief. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. Now our job is to find out whose laundry mark it is. Okay, Gene. Hello, Eddie. Uh, hi, Gene. Come on in. What are you doing up this early? Oh, I got another rhubarb going with Marge. Well, what are you waking me up for? Because it's all your fault. My fault? Yeah. How did I get into this thing? It's that job you did. The one last night? Yeah. I went home and told Marge I did it, and I gave her the 1500 like you said. Then this morning, she sees the papers, and she wants the rest of the 22 Gs. Oh. Well, I, I'm sorry, Gene. I didn't know I was going to get that much. Well, that don't help me any. Marge thinks I got the dough, and I'm holding out on her. Uh, look, Gene, I'll tell you the real story and square the rap for you. That won't work, Eddie. Why not? I already tried it. You told her I did the job? That's right. She didn't believe me. Well. Wow. Oh, you got me in an awful jam, Eddie. I was only trying to help you. This could break up my marriage. Well, what do you want me to do? Give me the 22,000. What? I want the 22 G's. Are you out of your mind? Eddie, I got to give that money to Marge. Now look, get out of here, will you? It's the only way I can square myself. Will you blow? I can't, Eddie. I can't leave here without the money. Now, come on, give it to me. Over my dead body. Okay. <gasps> I'm sorry, Eddie. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI provides national security. Now let's devote a minute to social security. Twelve, fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars. That's what your social security rights can be equivalent to, depending on your age, salary, and family situation. Considering those values, it will pay you to look into the special service on social security offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. This service consists of three steps. First step. Full information. Your Equitable Society representative is ready to give you a complete and accurate picture of Social Security as it applies to you and your family. He'll tell you whether you're a fully insured worker or only currently insured. 
and what difference this will make in benefits you would receive. Or if you're nearing retirement age, he'll tell you what kind of work you could do and still be eligible for Social Security payments. Why be uninformed or misinformed when thousands of dollars may be at stake? See your equitable representative soon. Second step, an immediate checkup on your position under Social Security. Social Security Administration recommends that you make these checkups regularly. They prevent errors being made in your account. And the easiest way to check your account is to get the special form from your equitable representative, a form approved by the Social Security Administration. Once you've determined your standing under Social Security, you're ready to benefit from the last step of this free service offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That step is to help you build Social Security into full security. Yes, your Equitable Society representative will show you how a comparatively modest investment in life insurance will build Social Security into full security. In other words, he'll give you an analysis to show how life insurance and Social Security Working as a team can give you and your family a future of freedom from money worries. There's no charge for this service. See your Equitable Society representative immediately. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file... The Henpecked Hijacker. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI illustrates the fact that although criminals may use different avenues of approach to gain their illegal ends, the common influence motivating them is avarice. Sheer, unadulterated, overwhelming greed. It is that greed which makes every criminal a parasite of our society. And in this case, as in biology, it is possible for the parasites to prove fatal unless we do something and do it quickly to prevent the number of criminals from multiplying as rapidly as they have been. We give our law enforcement agencies no chance to stop the crime wave. Those agencies have certain restrictions as to the number of men they employ, and it has been shown that a city can be so deluged with criminals that the law has no chance of being enforced, that the criminals become a law unto themselves. What is true of a city can be true of a state or of a nation, and for that reason the time for action is now, action on your part to help fight the never-ending war against crime. Tonight's file continues as Special Agents Taylor and Adams drive through city traffic. Slow down, Jim. There's our laundry. Mm, I see it. Hey, Ben, we're really lucky. We haven't got a place to park. Yeah. You want to slide out this side? Yeah, I might as well. well the switchboard really did a job locating this laundry so fast. Yeah, those operators really cut loose once they get a job to do. Go ahead, Jim. Thanks, man. Good morning. Morning. Something I could do for you? Oh, I'm Mr. Taylor from the FBI. Here are my credentials. Oh, yes, Mr. Taylor. I'm Mr. Merrick. Oh, yes, sir. This is Mr. Adams from our office. How do you Merrick, do? Merrick, how are you? This is the handkerchief our office told you about, Mr. Merrick. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Oh, yes, this is our laundry, Mark. Do you know who it belongs to? Yes, but I don't know his name. This belongs to a man who brings his laundry in every week, himself. I see. Can you tell us what he looks like? Yes, he's about 35, six foot tall, about 200 pounds. He's got black hair, and he's got a blue star tattooed on the back of his left hand. Well, that's a pretty complete description, Mr. Merrick. Mr. Adams, all my life I've been reading stories in the papers about the police. They come to a laundry to find out whose laundry mark it is, and always it's the same thing. They never get a good description. That's right. I made up my mind a long time ago that I would study my customers, and if the police ever asked the Merrick Laundry for a description, the Merrick Laundry would be ready. Well, I wish there were more people as conscientious as that, Mr. Merrick. Oh, by the way, where do you deliver this man's laundry? I don't deliver it, Mr. Taylor. He picks up his clean package when he brings in his dirty stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you know where he lives? No, I don't. All I know is that he lives in a hotel around here. Well, how do you know that, Mr. Merrick? Because the first time he brought in his laundry, he told me that his hotel did his shirts once, and they ruined three brand new ones. Well, he sounds like a very careful dresser. Oh, he is. Has he got any laundry with you now? Yes, he's got a package ready to be picked up. Fine. May we see it, please? Well, certainly. It's uh, right here under the counter. Yeah. When will I pick out the right box? 
Ah, yes, here it is. Here you are, gentlemen. Yes, he is a careful dresser, Ben. Mm-hmm. Every one of these shirts come from Merchant and Thompson up on 50th Street. Yes, they're very expensive shirts, Mr. Tallon. Ben, you've got the notes on that description that Mr. Merrick gave us, haven't you? Yes, Jim. Well, look, why don't you run back to the office, see if you can find anybody in our files answering that description, huh? Okay, Jim. While you're doing that, I'll go by Merchant and Thompson and see if they can tell me who they made these shirts for. Marge! Marge! What is it? Where are you? In the living room. In the living room. In the living room. What's the matter with you? What do you mean, what's the matter with me? Jean, you've been drinking. No kidding. You're drunk. So pose I am. Now, don't you talk that way to me. I'll talk to you any way I want, and you know why? Because I'm rich. You're rich. We're both rich. Now, look at this. Money, 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 money. So I was right. You did do that job. No, Eddie did the job. Then where did you get the money? I took it from Eddie. I hit him over the head. I hit him over the head and I took it. Gene, that's wonderful. I figured you'd think that way. What do you mean? Sweetheart, for your information, Eddie Perkins is my friend. I should say he was my friend. So what? I had a slugger guy. Maybe kill him for all I know and all to please you. Oh, shut up, Gene. Give me the money. You ain't getting it. What? I made up my mind in the saloon. You ain't getting one penny. Now listen, you Gene. You listen. Now for weeks now I've been here and do this, Gene, or I'll leave you. Do that, Gene, or I'll leave you. Well, here's a switch for you, kid. I want you to go. What? Yeah, you heard me. Now pack your bags and get out of here. Special Agent Adams. Hello, Ben. Oh, hiya, Jim. Where are you? I'm over at the shirt makers. The shirts were made for a thief named Eddie Perkins. Oh, I don't think I know him. He's got a long record. Was a hold-up man? Yeah, his last couple of arrests have been for armed robbery. Oh, did you get anything? Uh, no, Jim, not yet. The file room's still working on the description. Mm, I see. Have you got an address on Eddie Perkins at the store, Jim? Well, they're getting it for me now. Oh, well, uh, do you think I ought to get a warrant for Perkins' arrest before I leave the office? Yeah, it's a good idea. We'll, uh... Oh, excuse me, Ben. Fine. Thank you, sir. Ben, I've got Perkins' address. It's the Central Good. Hotel. Yeah. Meet you there in 15 minutes in the lobby. Ben, I got here sooner than I expected, so I went on upstairs. Did you find Perkins? No, he wasn't in, but I got enough evidence to prove that he did the job. Yeah, what would you find? Well, there were a half a dozen money bags from the Dawson Finance Company strewn all over the room. That's enough. And there was a fresh blood stain on the rug. How did that get there? I checked with Dr. Phillips. He's the house physician. He said he treated Perkins. For what? Head wound. When? About a half an hour ago. Well, was the head wound bad enough to prevent him from traveling? No, Ben, it wasn't. <laughs> Sounds like he's taken off with the loop. Well, I don't think so. Not according to the doctor's story. He says that Perkins was blazing mad and kept mumbling something about having been robbed. Yeah? Well, where did he go from the doctor's office? I don't know. But there's a doorman here at the hotel. A clerk has sent for him. The doctor have anything else, Jim? Well, he told me that he'd treated Perkins before and that he remembered that blue star that Mr. Merrick told us about that's tattooed on the back of his left hand. Yeah. Well, did the doctor know what Perkins' business was? No. No, he was quite surprised when I told him. Fella? Uh, yes, that's right. I'm the doorman. Oh, yes. Uh, tell me, did you see Mr. Perkins leave about a uh, half hour ago? Hey, yes, sir. I got him a cab. Would you have any idea where he was going? Well, I only heard him tell the hacky he wanted to go to Midtown Village. Uh, that's a pretty big development, Jim. Yes, I know. There are 18 apartment houses there, and I think there are 60 apartments in every building. Yeah, but I think we can find Perkins if he's still there. Can I be of any more help to you, gentlemen? Yes, would you get us a cab, please? Ben, we're going to Midtown Village ourselves. Haven't you started to pack yet? Oh, Jean. Don't give me that. How can you do this to me? It's real easy. Oh. Jean. What is it? Why are you making me go away? You know why. I can't believe that's the real reason. 
You found another girl. That's why you're acting like this, isn't it? No. Then how could you be so cruel? Well, look, this was your idea in the first place. What do you mean? Going away. You've been threatening to do it right along. Oh, Gene, I was wrong. I don't want to go. Now, look. Please I... listen to me. Let me stay, honey. I'll never say I'll leave you again, honest. Well... Please. Uh... Who's that? Probably the cab I called for you. Tell him to go away, honey. Please. Well, okay. Hello, smart boy. Eddie! Step back. Eddie Perkins. That's right, Marge. But I thought you were... Dead, maybe? Now, that's how my pal here left Look, me. Eddie, I can explain. I don't want any explanations. I want my dough. I know. I'm giving it back to you. What? I'm giving him back his money, Marge. Wait a minute. What about that mink coat and that jewelry? I thought we settled all that. How? We just made up, remember? That had nothing to do with the 22000 we'll I'm not... some other time, You keep you? out of this. Gene, if you give him back that money, I'm leaving you. Now, look! I mean I... It. Wait a minute, both of you. I have a gun here, see it? This gun calls for money. Hey. Drop that gun, Perkins. Covering, Ben. Right. Who are you? Special agents of the FBI. Well, thank heavens. You got here just in time to save us from being robbed of $22,000. Really? Where is it? Show it to him, Gene. You hear me? Okay. Here's some of it. Thank you. Ben. Yeah, Jim. Check the serial numbers on these bills with the ones that Dawson gave us, will you? Right. What does that mean? I think it should tell us who was really robbed of the 22000 Eddie Perkins was convicted for violation of the federal impersonation statute. He was then turned over to local authorities for prosecution for robbery. Gene and Marge Wheeler were also turned over to local authorities for obtaining under false pretense and robbery. Special Agent Taylor was pretty certain that Eddie Perkins could be traced at Midtown Village with ease because the doctor at the hotel who had treated him mentioned that he had bandaged Perkins' head. Once at Midtown Village, it was, as Taylor had guessed, simple to find out where the man with the bandaged head had gone and to follow that rather wide trail. And thus was your FBI able once again to close a case with a conviction and to close it within a matter of hours after the initial crime was reported. True, that meant working all night and most of the next day, but no special agent is a clock watcher. He works as your FBI has trained him to work, 24 hours a day if need be, and around the clock again if that will help him do his job. His job of fighting incessant warfare against America's army of criminals. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now a quick review of the special three-point service offered by your Equitable Society representative to help you get the most out of Social Security. First, he gives you a clear picture of what Social Security can accomplish for you. Second, your Equitable Society representative supplies you with a special form approved by the Social Security Administration for checking up on your position under Social Security. Third, he shows you how easy and inexpensive it is to build Social Security into full security. Don't fail to take advantage of this special service by your equitable representative and the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case that dramatizes the most venal crime in the federal statutes. Its subject, kidnapping. Its title, Operation Ransom. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. 
and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Operation Ransom on This Is Your FBI. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you covered by Social Security? Then please listen carefully. Public opinion polls by the Equitable Life Assurance Society show that millions of Americans know little about their Social Security. Yes, according to these Equitable Society surveys, you may be failing to safeguard rights worth thousands of dollars. Therefore, as a public service, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will devote this program's entire middle commercial due in just 14 minutes to information on Social Security. Information that may mean money in your pocket. Tonight's FBI file, Operation Ransom. The motives which lie behind the more than one and a half million major crimes committed every year in this country are as varied as the types of crimes themselves. Some criminals engage in illegal activities because of the temptation for so-called easy money. Others commit crimes out of passion or because of a craving for revenge. But whatever the motive, every criminal believes that he will succeed without paying for his crime. He is sure that circumstances will conspire to make his capture impossible because, as he sees it, he has every advantage on his side. Not only must he be captured... But he must then be proven guilty beyond the shadow of a doubt. What he does not realize is that actually there are no advantages on his side, except for one. That single asset which always belongs to the criminal is the element of time. For he alone is the one who decides when the crime is to take place. He alone is the one who decides which is the proper moment for him to strike. Tonight's file opens near a bridal path in a large park in a Midwestern city. Two men are strolling along a gravel path. Take it easy, Harry. Hmm? Huh? I walk so fast we're not going any place. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's a lovely spring morning, Harry. Mm-hmm. Man doesn't get enough of these. Yeah. Look around you, Harry. Isn't it glorious? George, we didn't come out to admire the scenery. I know, Harry. We've got work to do. Still enjoy nature. Just look at that grass sprouting up. The tiny green buds in the trees. Why, a man. George, there she goes. I see her. Yeah, she's right on time again. She's been on time every day now for a week. So she has, Harry. Well, it's about time we made our move. We're not ready yet. That's what you've been saying all week. We ain't ready now, we'll never be. Harry, I've told you before, the success of any venture rests on the planning. We got plans? But we haven't insured them yet. When will that be? When we know everything there is to know about Alice Woods. Every habit she has, every friend she has, even every hat she wears. Those things take time, Harry, but they reduce the risk. That's the important thing. Mm, I know, I know. We'll be ready soon. When we are, the young lady will be kidnapped. days later, in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor has just entered the office of Agent in Charge Evans. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Jim. Sit down. Thank you. Here's the name and address of a woman who just called me. I'd like you to go over and see her. All right, sir. Mrs. Martha Woods, 720 North 50th Street, huh? Mrs. Woods said that her daughter is missing. How did she happen to call here? 
She called the local police, and they suggested that she get in touch with us. Oh, I see. There's a suspicion of kidnapping, and that's why we're in it. Oh? Now, it may or may not be the reason she's missing, but we're better off playing it safe and getting in at the start. I see, sir. Um, Did Mrs. Woods tell you anything? Yeah, she said that she got a phone call from a girl named Rosemary Rice, who's a friend of her daughter's. What's her daughter's name? Alice Woods. Mm -hmm. Uh, The girlfriend said that she was riding a horse in the park this morning, some hundred yards or so behind Miss Woods, and she saw the missing girl stop and dismount. Where was that, sir? Near 53rd Street entrance to the park. She mm-hmm. walked over to talk to a man who had called her while she was riding. Miss uh, Rice didn't recognize this man, did you? I don't know, Jim. At any rate, the man walked the girl over to a car that was parked at the roadside. There, they met another man, and the three of them spoke for a few seconds. I see. Then Miss Woods was forced into the car, and it drove off. Any description on the car? Yes, it was a 1947 Buick sedan, color black. Any license plate number? No, but it was an out-of-state license. Out-of-state. Go up and see if you can get a picture of Alice Woods from her mother. If you can, have some copies made. All right, sir. Uh, I'm also putting Bob Clinton on this case to work with you, Jim. Fine. As soon as you get back, we can have a meeting and decide which move to make first. Who's that? Me? Oh. Always everything. The young girl's asleep. I was just in there. Did she wake up at all? No. These pills really put her away. I wish I'd taken some. What do you mean? Well, I couldn't hear that music. What are they playing on? Washboard? <laughs> Harry, you just aren't a music lover. That's music? The customers think so. You ought to go downstairs and see the business that joins to No, 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 thanks. It's bad enough up here. I just sent the note to Jocko. Oh? What'd you ask for? 25000 I wonder if he'll go for it. Got to. This is his daughter. He loves the kid. $25,000 is a lot of moolah. Not to Jocko. I say, suppose he goes to the cops. Harry, bookmaker can't go to the cops. That's why we picked the guy. Uh-huh. That's one of the things I was trying to explain to you when I told you about calculated risks. Uh, I, I know. I remember. Now, what's our next move? Well, we wait for Jocko to answer the note with the ad in the paper. Then we tell him where to plant the dough. Now, how long do you figure that'll take? If all goes well, about another day. How many times a day do they play that music down there? From nine to closing, about six hours. Uh, I'll just about make it. Yes, sir. Yes, Jim. I got Alice Wood's photograph from her mother. Good. Have you ordered any copies? Yes, sir. Oh, I found out something about the girl that might give us the motive for the kidnapping. What's that, Jim? Her father is Jocko Morgan. The bookmaker? That's right, sir. How'd you find that out? Well, Mrs. Woods told me that she had received a phone call from her ex-husband. He said that he'd gotten a ransom note and wanted to know whether or not the girl really had been kidnapped. And Jocko Morgan is her ex-husband? That's it, sir. They've been divorced for 15 years, and Mrs. Woods has resumed her maiden name. Oh, incidentally, she told me that her daughter believes that her father is dead. Have you been to see Morgan? Yes, sir. I went over to his apartment. Did he give you the note? No, not at first. In fact, he denied any knowledge of it. He was probably going to pay the money and not say anything to the police. I imagine so, yes. But he finally agreed to talk about it. In fact, he wound up begging us to help him find his daughter. That's a bit ironical. A man like Morgan asking the law to help him. Yes, isn't it? Well, we have to give the same cooperation we... Give to any other citizen? I realize that, sir. So I advised Morgan to follow the kidnapper's instructions and place the ad in tomorrow morning's papers. Where's the ransom note? I have it right here, sir. Uh, send it down to the lab for a check against the paper and typewriting standards. All right, sir. Mr. Evans. Oh, come in, Bob. Yes, sir. Hello, Jim. Hi, Bob. I uh, just interviewed the Rice girl, sir. Alice Wood's girlfriend? Yes, sir. She told me she could recognize one of the men if she saw him again. Did she describe him to you? Oh, no, not very well. But I'm going to meet her tomorrow morning at police headquarters and have her go over some pictures for us. Uh, Jim. Sir. You take Bob out to your desk and bring him up to date on the new elements in this case. And when you finish, check back here with me. Sleep, didn't you? Where 
am I? In a room? I mean, where? What is this place? It's a building. I want to go home. I don't blame you. Why are you keeping me here? It's a matter of money. What do you mean? We're holding you here till your old man pays off. My father? Yeah, that's right. But my father's dead. Since when? He died when I was a little girl. Oh, <laughs> had me scared for a minute. <laughs> so you won't be collecting from him? Oh, yes, we will. How? He ain't dead. What? Yeah, I just seen him last week. My, my father? Yes, your old man is Jocko Morgan. He's the biggest bookmaker in town. But if you think he's dead, you can get three to one from him personally that he ain't. You're, you're lying. Well, now, look, I can prove it to you. Uh, who's that? Uh, I'll be right with you. But wait a minute. I'll see you later. The girl awake? Yeah, awake and crying. What's she crying about? I don't know. I just told her her old man was a bookmaker and she bust into tears. <laughs> sure wouldn't make me cry if my old man was a bookmaker. Yeah, look at this. What is it? Jocko ran the ad, see it? Oh, yeah. Huh. When do we get the door? You go in for it tonight. Are you busy, sir? Well, come in, Jim. Well, the ransom money has been planted. Good. We went to the vacant lot where it was supposed to be left. Morgan put the package beside the big rock with a white cross on it. Clinton stayed up there? Yes, sir, he did. He has a good vantage point. He'll call in just as soon as the money is picked up. Fine. Oh, did uh, anything come back from the lab on that ransom note, sir? Yes, but it wasn't much help. Mm -hmm. The paper is a cheap, common brand, and the typing was done in a typewriter without too many distinguishing marks. Fine, sir. Uh, pardon me, Jim. Certainly. Evans talking. Hello, sir. This is Clinton. Yes, Bob. What have you got? Money was just picked up. Who is it? Me. Open up. Right. Did you get it? Yeah. Swell. Any trouble? No. All right, let's have the package. Uh, sure. Yeah. It's torn open. I, I just took a peek at stuff to make sure it was real. You're sure nobody tailed you? No, nope, no, nope, nobody tailed me. Last five miles, I was the only car on the road. Uh, want me to help you? How? Counting the money. I can do it. <laughs> All that green stuff. And it's real. And it's ours. Uh, it's beautiful, beautiful. Now all we got to do is return the girl and the job's over. Oh, I forgot to tell you, we're not returning them. Hey, why not? Well, I had a talk with her. It seems she's not willing just to go home and forget all about this. Oh. She says she's going to the police and tell them that we did the job. Well, she don't know who we are. Do mm, she? Knows what we look like. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, uh, what are we going to do with it? You're going to take her partway back to town, to the Smith Park Bridge. Uh, then what? Then you get rid of her. Oh, now, look, Harry, I... all I said in the note was that when we got the money, we'd release her. Well, when you get to the bridge, release her. Into the river. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI provides national security. Now a timely announcement on social security. Equitable Life Assurance Society surveys indicate that most people know little about their rights under social security. To correct this situation, the Equitable Society offers listeners a special service consisting of three steps. First step, full information. Your Equitable Society representative is an expert on Social Security. He's qualified to answer such puzzling questions as... Suppose a widow waits three years after her husband's death before making a claim for Social Security. Can she collect all the back payments she might have received? The answer is no. Your Equitable representative will explain why. Does a man automatically start to receive Social Security benefits on his 65th birthday? Again, the answer is no. Your equitable representative will explain why. The second step in this equitable service is an immediate checkup on your position under Social Security. Since some errors cannot be corrected after four years, the Social Security Administration advises you to protect yourself by checking up regularly. 
Your Equitable Society representative will supply you with a special form approved by the Social Security Administration and show you what to do it. Then you're ready for the final step. That step is to help you build Social Security into full security. After you've found out where you stand in Social Security, your Equitable Society representative will show you how a comparatively modest investment in life insurance will build Social Security into full security. He'll show you how life insurance and Social Security, working as a team, can give you and your family a future free from money worries. There's no obligation whatsoever. So see your Equitable Society representative or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Operation Ransom. Those who have made the field of crime their life work, who study constantly in an effort to understand the mind of the criminal and the forces which impel him to break the law, have agreed that there is no common prototype among the seven and a half million persons with arrest records in the United States. Some dress well, some dress badly. Some are well educated, some are totally unschooled. Some are tall, some are short. The various discrepancies between any two criminals can be as wide as those between any two law-abiding citizens. And yet, they do have their common bond, the things which make every criminal kin to every other criminal. One of those things, and this applies to those who commit crimes against property or crimes against the person, is that he is insulated against any feeling of compassion for his fellow man. To him, to the true criminal... The world exists so that he may live. And the easier that living comes, the better he likes it. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. What time is it, Jim? I have, uh, 12.23, sir. So have I. I thought my watch stepped. I hope nothing has gone wrong. So do I, Jim. The girl should have been released by now unless they've been holding her an awful long way from town. Yes, I know. How long do you think we ought to wait, sir, before we start searching? If we don't hear anything by one o'clock, we'll go into action. Have we got the serial numbers on the bills that Morgan used to pay the ransom with? Yes, the stenographic section is making copies of the list now. As soon as it's prepared, we'll start printing the ransom list for distribution. I see. One o'clock, we'll send a copy to each of the newspapers, ask them to print it. You know, it's too bad we can't mark the money in cases like this. Yes, it is, but we don't dare gamble with the victim's life. Uh, I know, sir. Mr. Evans, can I come in? Uh, yes, Bob, what have you got? Alice Woods has been found. Where? When? She ran up to the toll gate at the Smith Park Bridge a few minutes ago. Is she all right, Bob? Well, she was exhausted and suffering from shock. Where is she now? At the Memorial Hospital, sir. Jim, you and Bob get over there at once. <laughs> calling up for? We uh, got trouble, George. Why? What happened? Well, I, I go to the bridge, like you said. Yeah? And uh, I, I stopped the car and opened the back door. Go on. When I, when I opened the door, she ran up the other side of the car. Well, how could she do that? She was tied up, wasn't well, she? Yeah, but I, I guess she must have worked herself loose. Well, did you catch her? No, no, I couldn't. What? It, it was dark. She got away. You I... stupid fool. I planned everything no, perfectly. No, I'm sorry, George. A lot of good that'll do us. There's no telling how much she knows about where she was being held. She could lead the cops right back here. No, 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 she can't. Uh, she was still blindfolded just before I stopped it. George, what should I do now? Come on back here as fast as you can. Miss Wood, do you feel up to talking about your experience now? Yes, Mr. Taylor. I'll tell you whatever I can remember. That's fine, thanks. Now, first, we'd like to know how the kidnappers approached you. Well, 
I was riding in the park when a man standing on the side of the bridle path called after me. Did he know your name, Miss Woods? Yes, Mr. Clinton, he did. That's why I stopped. I see. I rode back to where he was standing, and he said that I had to come with him right away. My mother had been in a serious accident. He didn't say where, did he? No, sir, he didn't. Uh, well, what happened then? I dismounted, and the man led me to a car. When I got there, I saw another man. This uh, second man, was he behind the driver's wheel? Yes, that's right. I asked what kind of an accident Mother had had, and the man said she'd been driving her car down Oak Avenue and been hit by a truck. Mm, I see. Go on. I knew then that they were lying to me because Mother doesn't drive. Oh. I started to scream, but the man who called me clapped his hand over my mouth and threw me into the car. And that's when they drove away with you? Yes, sir. Uh, what did they do once they had you in the car, Miss Woods? The man in back with me blindfolded me and put a gag in my mouth. Then he covered me with a blanket. Uh-huh, I see. And did both men drive you back to the Smith Park Bridge tonight? No, sir, only one of them. That's how I was able to escape. I heard them planning to kill me, so when I got in the car, I used all my strength, and finally I got my hands loose. Were you gagged and blindfolded on the return trip, too? Yes, sir, until I got my hands loose, and that wasn't until just before we got to the cliff, by the bridge. Mm. Miss Woods, you don't know where you were held, do you? No, sir. I haven't the faintest idea. Well, is there anything you can tell us about the ride after you got in the car in the park? Did you hear any odd sounds or any conversation between the men? Well, let me think. Sure. Oh, a, a little while after we started, one of the men asked the other one for a, a quarter for the bridge. It must be the Smith Park Bridge at all there's a quarter. Mm -hmm. Miss Woods, would you know which way you turned when you got off the bridge? No, I don't. But, but I remember after we rode a while... I heard some planes warming up, as if they were about to take off. You're sure they weren't flying above you? Oh, no, sir. I've done some flying, and I can tell the difference. Good. Now, is there anything else? Let's see. Oh, yes. A little bit after that, we went past what sounded like a waterfall. A waterfall? Yes. Jim, there, there are no waterfalls in this section. That's what it sounded like to me, Mr. Clinton. I'm sorry. Please go on. Well, let's see. We rode for a little while more, and, and then we got on a bumpy road. And do you remember which way you turned to get onto this bumpy road? I don't remember turning. Oh? We only went a very short way on it, though, before we stopped, and I was carried into a building and taken upstairs. Still blindfolded? Yes. Now, did you hear anything in this building? Well, not then, but, but later on, after they fed me my dinner, I heard some music. Do you remember where it came from, Miss Woods? It seemed to come from underneath where I was... First, I thought it was just a radio, but they played so badly, I decided it was real music. Miss Woods, can you describe these two men to us? Yes, surely. Good. Suppose you start right now. Uh, yes, Jim. Alice Woods identified the two pictures I brought her as the men who kidnapped her. Oh, good. Who are they? One of them is uh, George Payne. The other is Harry Rollins. Here's some copies of the pictures. Oh, fine. Now our job is to find out where they took the girl. Oh, I picked up that map you wanted. Swell. That's it? Mm-hmm. Now, here's where the trip started. Uh -huh. And this is the exit they used to leave the park. Right. And they went up the drive to the Smith Park Bridge. Yeah. Now... The problem is, which way did they turn when they got off the bridge? Uh, well, we know they went past an airport mm -hmm. very soon after they left the bridge. Uh, look, there's Hurley Field. Right. They'd have gone by that if they turned left. But, Jim, if they turned right, they'd have gone by Western Airport. Oh, yeah. So they could have gone either way. Yeah, that's right. Now, the next thing Miss Woods remembered was that waterfall. That's a real baffler. <laughs> I know that section. There is no waterfall. The only... Bob, I know what it was. What? It was the Barrel Point Dam. I remember seeing a story in the paper this week that they opened the sluice gates on the dam because the water got too high. Well, then they must have turned right off the bridge. Check. And the next thing is that bumpy road. If we find that, we can find out where she was held. Let's see. She said they only went a short way on it. Mm -hmm. Bob, I know that highway. There are no side roads on it. And I drove it last summer. It's as smooth as glass. I sh Hey, wait a minute. What is it? Got an idea, Bob. Let's get to a phone. <laughs> Hello, genius. 
Look, I, I told you I was sorry, didn't I? It doesn't make up for your mistake. There was nothing I could do. You could have seen to it that she didn't get away. You need brains in this business, Harry. I've Look, told George, you. I know how smart you are, but I'm kind of tired of hearing about it. Suppose you give me my money and we'll call it quits, huh? What money? My cut. You better forget that. Huh? You're not getting anything. That's a joke I ain't laughing. I'm dead serious. George, you can't do this to me. Harry, I have a gun here that permits me to do anything. No. Who's that? All right, step back. Hey, hey what do you say? In the FBI. You let him tell you back here. No, I didn't. All right, come on, you two. Yeah, but we did... We're not going to blindfold you like you blindfolded Miss Woods. Now, we're going to let you see where you're going. And I have a hunch you'll recognize the jail when we get there. George Payne and Harry Rollins were tried, convicted, and sentenced to serve 50-year terms in a federal prison for kidnapping. Your FBI was led to the roadhouse where Miss Woods had been held captive because every clue, no matter how slim it appeared, was followed to its conclusion. One of those clues was that Miss Woods remembered that she had been driven by the kidnappers over a bumpy road and that the car had stopped shortly afterwards. A check with the State Highway Commission showed that there was a part of the highway under repair, but open to traffic. The roadhouse was situated beside that section of the highway. And so your FBI was able to close another file, to close it the way almost every kidnapping file has been closed, with the word convicted stamped across it. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, a quick review of the three-point Social Security service offered by your Equitable Society representative. First, it gives you a clear picture of what Social Security can accomplish for you. Second, your Equitable Society representative supplies you with a special form approved by the Social Security Administration for checking up on your position. Third, he shows you how easy it is to build Social Security into full security. Take advantage of this special service offered without charge by your equitable representative and the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A factual account of the operation of a stolen car ring. Its subject, interstate theft. It's titled, The Unwilling Partner. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The unwilling partner on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.